I'll take some questions at the end, and I'm sure there are lots of questions. But our next speaker is uh, Professor Ali Seva, who is again a colleague and dear friend and works with us uh, in our MDT at Guy's Hospital. Uh, technical wizard, very good radiologist, and also works with Kestra, the screening program. Uh, does lots of magical things with needles. And he's going to show us something, um, I mean, some of those tricks today about uh, core biopsies, vacuum excisions, and obviously a bit, of more, bit more about uh, radiology. So over to you, Ali. It may be that you're muted, Ali. We can't see you, we cannot hear you, Ali. You just need to unmute your... Uh... I'll just unmute myself. That's great. Yes, I was just telling, I'm not sure whether, definitely as radiologists, we are not Kirk or Spock, but I'm not sure whether we can qualify as McCoy or I don't know whom. Uh, thank you very much, Ash, for your in, uh, introduction. Uh, my talk is slightly obviously covered by Kestra and slightly with uh, Sarah, but more my part is more of the action part of the of the things, uh, when to excise and how to excise uh, of these B3 lesions, which are uh, which are a complicated uh, uh, group of lesions. The vacuum assisted devices are developed in the late 1990s. I know this period, I was a radiologist, a breast radiologist at the time. It came into the UK in 1999. And I was first, uh, in my hospital, we purchased this uh, in 2000. I, I guess we were either the second or the third uh, uh, in the country. And this was at the time only for diagnostic purposes. Uh, and it was only initially, only stereotactic uh, equipment attached to a, a, a prone table or an upright table. This was the Mamotom, that was only the commercial available equipment there. And here, I'm not sure you probably can't see my white hair now, gray hair, but this was uh, me in those days. And, and then later, the extended use of excision uh, came. This been maybe in the last 10, 15 years are becoming more and more uh, commonly used. This is less invasive than surgical excision, and it's a more cost effective procedure approach. We, I am a radiologist, so we radiologists do know our limitations. So this is probably a, a, a wider surgical team who is listening to me. So we are definitely not stepping your toes, surgeons. We are, we are very modest radiologists and you are very important. And we do know that although we are playing a little bit of a surgical role here in exercising these lesions, but we know our limitations, our capabilities. So we don't want to do too much uh, too risky things. So we radiologists, as Kestra said, uh, there are a group of lesions do not touch. We don't touch them. ATPR, papillary lesions, fibroepithelial, miscellaneous lesions. We know we don't touch them. The ones that we are slightly braver to touch, to do something, are the ones I'm going to speak in a minute. Uh, but a general information about the vacuum assisted excision, this is not a first test. Even if I expect strongly from imaging that it's going to be a papilloma, I know it's a, it is likely going to be papilloma. I won't go and just do an excision uh, without doing a diagnostic biopsy. As Sarah told, uh, it may interfere with future, with further uh, pathological assessment should this come as an atypical, uh, uh, if it has got some ATP in it. Uh, it is a therapeutic procedure, VAE. That is why MDM decision and MDM support is important. And vacuum assisted devices, there are a few now in the market. They usually use either somewhere between 10 to 7G needles. This is the current one that we're using at Kings and at Guys. Uh, you just, I'm going to show you a video in a minute about that also, but uh, just for, uh, for the surgical team if they have not seen this. So you approach with, through the lesion either, either inside or just underneath, and then with the suction, with the vacuum, it gradually takes and the tissue has been sucked outside and you repeat this several times. Uh, adequate sampling requires four gram of tissue. That is the guideline. It can be done under ultrasound, under stereo, both has got pros and cons. Ultrasound, you can see the real time of the lesion much better. So you know your lesion is, your needle is bang in the middle of the lesion or just immediately underneath. Whereas stereo, it may not be because it is a, obviously in a squeezed breast with a 15 degree to angle. Uh, so your needle can be a little bit deeper, a little bit superficial. You may not be in the center of the lesion. 
Whereas stereo, you are doing this in a compressed press, so with the accordion, the tissues, although the needle has got a 20 millimeter cutting edge, uh, when you take the needle, when you take the tissues, you see the tissues are much longer than 20 millimeters because you already squeeze the breast in a, in, a, in, a, in a very compressed press, you're cutting that 20 millimeters. So it translates itself as a longer tissues, as a, a more voluminous tissues compared to ultrasound. Uh, normally, if we do 9G vacuum needle, that is what we use, 30 cores equals to four gram in our routine practice. Usually we do first the stereo, the diagnostic procedure, we take 12 cores. And then if it comes as B3 lesion, and if, it, if the MDM says, okay, uh, gives us the green light, then we take some further tissues to try to uh, sum this up. And ultrasound, the first diagnostic core is often 14G, so it's a much smaller tissue. Uh, that's why on the second time when we do a VAE, then we have to take more tissues, like up to 30 tissues, although we try to do this as, as a reasonable number of course, not always necessarily we can't one by 130, because if a papilloma is a very small papilloma, then we take enough tissues. Uh, we don't always count religiously to get it 30. It's a single insertion needle, so it is, it's not unlike the other uh, spring-loaded equipment. Uh, excision is usually done in the same modality. If we first, the diagnostic is done stereotactically, then we try to do this again stereotactically to excise most of the time, sometimes you can just go to the clip, but usually we try to do the same. If it was ultrasound, then we go ultrasound for the VAE. And it is important, there may always be an upgrade. That's why clip insertion is, is in, of, of, of very important uh, issue. If you don't deploy the clip and if it comes as an upgrading and un, uh, a surprise abnormality, and if you take all the evidence of the disease, then you are in trouble. That's why clip insertion is important. Also clip is insertion is also important. Even if it is benign lesion, if it is the end of the treatment, end of the procedure, in the future, when you see that patient uh, with some distortion at the side of the cavity, if you don't have the clip, then you always have trouble. What is, is that distortion, something, some pathology, or is this a post biopsy scarring? So that's why clip always helps us to tell that there's been a biopsy done. The, the first three group, as we always said, that this is the more ATPR. So I'm just going to show you a couple of, uh, a couple of samples about the, the first three group, i.e. deflate epithelia and, and lobulinar plasia. They are usually, usually we diagnose them in the screening population, and they usually show themselves in the form of, of microcalcifications, either clustered, several clusters, or one or several clusters, or a whole segment from one end to another. Now, the size of calcification, as my previous uh, speaker told, is not that important. You don't have to remove every, if it's a five centimeter cluster of uh, segmental calcification, you know that you cannot remove them all. You have to have an adequate sampling. If the, if the, if the size is large, ideally you should go to two different areas. Uh, or if there are clusters, try to aim for the most suspicious looking clusters. And uh, it's also important to know from the pathologist will tell you that even if, your, even if your target is the calcification, you need to know if the calcification is indeed in associated to this B3 lesion. At times what happens that the pathologist tells us that the calcification is in benign lobules, but the say lobular neoplasia is just at an incidental lesion sitting in that area. So that's important to know. So this is one uh, ADEP case where you can see the cluster of calcification and we successfully biopsy this. And then once this is proven to be ADEP, so we have to go back now, take some more tissues to fulfill this as an, as a, as, as an excision. Similar, this is a lobular neoplasia. Again, uh, we have removed this and we found out that it was a calcification uh, that was pathology. And, and then we go back there. This is another case of lobular neoplasia. This time we've got three clusters, three separate clusters, which they cover an area of like four centimeter. So we biopsy this, we took the calcification and we found out that it was an incidental uh, finding. The lobular neoplasia was nothing to do with this calcification. They were all benign. So then our now job is now, next time when we do this excision. So we are not going to go to some further calcifications. Now we know that these calcifications are benign. So we lost all our interest to these calcifications. Now all our interest is this 
area where the clip where we have initially biopsy. So we have to go to back to this area, make sure we take out the old clip, replace with a new one, and make sure that we have to find out if there are some uh, some abnormalities, upgrading abnormalities in the vicinity of the initial biopsy. Radial scars often present themselves with an area of distortion, and usually we can see them on ultrasound. Sometimes, not un not uncommonly, uh, our stereotactic biopsies for calcifications can come as radial scar. And again, size does not matter. And tie removal may not always be achieved. Here is a smaller radial scar, which we have removed all of it. As you see, the marker clip has been taken all out. And But this is a large area. It's being reported as 35 millimeters. So we cannot remove this all of it. So we are not aiming to remove all of it, but we would like to remove maybe here some tissues and then here to add up to four gram altogether. And this was done. Indeed, we have taken and we have deployed two, two markers. Papillomas without atypia, if atypia, we don't touch them. Without atypia is our, uh, is our uh, type of lesions that we can do something. They can present themselves in the symptomatic population with nipple discharge, but in our series, more of them are again incidental, not necessarily uh, most of the, in, the, in the screening population, we regularly uh, encounter papillomas. This is one case I'm going to show you as a video clip. So this is a papilloma here you can see it's 11 millimeters It's a nice position. Uh, here's the skin and here is, uh, you can see. So what we will do is we are going to put our needle. This is the needle. So now I'm going to, here's the lesion. Now you're going to see the video. The, the needle is coming here. So now I know that most of the lesion is above my needle and maybe a little bit still underneath. So my free hands, I can always take several tissues from here and then I keep on rotate my needle with my hand because it's a handhold hand hold device. So not just go to the 12 o'clock, you can go a little bit to six o'clock, to nine o'clock, to three o'clock. So you can make a good circle to ensure that you remove all of it. Sorry, let me get to the next slide. So now once we are here, so we, we open the needle, the suction starts and it starts to cut gradually. And in front of your eyes, you see the lesion gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Once we think it's all done, we take the needle out. So now we think that there's nothing left. This is a small ca cavity there. We take the needle out. And now this is the cavity, small volume of hematoma, as you can see. Now is the time to deploy a clip. So now we know that there's a, there's a small hematoma there. This is the hematoma. Now let's deploy the clip. The marker insertion we do under ultrasound. You, we use hydrogel marker clip, which is nicely visible. Here is it's coming, and here is my marker clip, as you see. And once it's been deployed, I'm happy. Now it is. So now case is done. So, and here are the tissues that we have retrieved. These are 9G tissues. So not all papillomas are for VAE. This is a patient incidental present with a palpable lump. This was lobular invasive lobular carcinoma in the right breast. And incidental, when we done, because she's got lobular carcinoma, we, as per guideline, we do MRI and we incidentally identify two lesions, contralateral breast. And, and this is the one lesion and this is the second lesion. They were both, the, this is much typical appearance of a papilloma. You can see this is the nipple. And the lesion is very close to the nipple, only three millimeters away from the nipple. We biopsied both of them with 14G ultrasound guided core biopsies. We proved them both papilloma, although they have got no atypia, but because of its vicinity to nipple, we don't biopsy them, we don't VAE them. So this is not for even, uh, even if it is uh, technically possible, uh, doable, we don't uh, because of its vicinity to the nipple or to the skin. This is another patient where we identified a soft tissue lesion. And while uh, we were scanning, we found another one in the vicinity. And then while scanning, we found another one again, but they're spread. And then 
uh, we biopsy two of these lesions. They were both came as papilloma, but we knew that there are more than two, three, four maybe. And then we decided to go ahead with an MRI and MRI showed us that there are several enhancing lesions. We don't even know how many of them are definitely papillomas or background enhancements. So these are the cases where we can't really do much about uh, if you educate the sample, then you should stop there. You can't, uh, you can't unfortunately uh, excise every, uh, every of them. So VAE is a well-tolerated procedure. Minor complications, hematoma, as Kestra said, is, is the main. So it's important. Hematoma does not happen during the procedure because with the suction, with the vacuum, you suck the blood out. This happens as soon as you take the needle out, then the hematoma starts to form. That's why a, a, a quick compression and a, and a lengthy and a robust compression is important. Infection is theoretically, obviously, every nick in the skin is a course, course, uh, source of infection, although I have personally never seen one after this procedure, but can happen. We always warn the patients if it's a papillary lesion, we always warn them that they may experience some bloody nipple discharge and shouldn't uh, continue too long and scarring often, but usually you don't see them sitting here for a very long time, but sometimes skin indentation or uh, retractions can happen. Uh, it's correct patient selection is very important. So we are not, we are brave, but not too brave. So you have to be very, very wise to pick up the correct patients. MDM support is very important. So you cannot just go and do these excisions uh, uh, without having uh, adequately discussed and adherence to guidelines important and also mind you even the ones that we are excising and which we think we are very much happy we still keep them under surveillance we're not just going to discharge them fully thank you very much